Hi, my name's Mark. I work for NOAA, and I help the team. <laughs> so how do exactly we do this? How does one advise NOAA on issues of coastal resilience? So this topic has been on my mind a lot for the past year because this time a year ago, I had never worked for the federal government before, and I knew exactly two people at NOAA. So I have a lot of learning to do. And like any good question, the question of how you advise NOAA on coastal resilience doesn't have a set answer. How do you reduce flood risk for your community, your state, or the nation? How do you build a consulting practice around water resource management and reach the big leagues and get hired by FEMA to help them deliver their mission and then actually help them to deliver their mission? How do you design an academic research program where the results actually make a difference on the ground? How do you transform risk communication in ways that actually drive behavior and positive outcomes? How do you advise NOAA on coastal resilience? So these are all open-ended questions. We know well enough that there's not just a set series of steps that you go through. Uh, what you do is a lot of listening, a lot of trial by error, and that's what I've been doing on the past year, trying to combine that with my own insight and experience. And I'd like to share with you some of my journey over the past year. So little story, first day on the job, not even at the job, I'm in my home. Kiss the kids goodbye, they're headed to school. I'm in my spiffy new suit, right? Proud as hell ready to go change the world, and I'd say, hey, Maureen, Maureen, how do I look? Going to the first day at NOAA. She says, oh, Mark, you look like a bureaucrat. <laughs> this is like my goal, right? Cure hashtag career goals, I made it. And so if I'm a bureaucrat, well, what does my agency do? What does NOAA do for coastal resilience? And how does what NOAA does here connect with what the Army Corps does, with what FEMA does, with what EPA, USGS, and all the rest are doing. Uh, and that has been a hard question, and we keep collecting data to make progress on that. But to start with, what is NOAA's mission overall as an agency? So here's our mission. This is what we do. This is why we exist. Science, service, and stewardship. But like every federal agency, the specifics of what we do in this space and why we do it are governed by our authorizations. We've been told at some point by the executive or legislative branch that thou shall do X, Y, or Z. And on the good years, we're appropriated properly to actually deliver all that stuff for the public. So an example might be the Magnus Stevens Fishing Conservation and Management Act. NOAA, thou shall regulate commercial and recreational fishing. Okay, easy, boom. Stand up the National Marine Fisheries Service, and here we go. NOAA, thou shall administer the Coastal Zone Management Act and provide charting for safe navigation for maritime commerce. Okay, great. National Ocean Service, get to it. Their Office for Coastal Management and Office of Coast Survey, get to work. Or NOAA, you shall provide weather forecasts and warnings to reduce the impacts of lost life and negative impacts to the economy. Excellent. National Weather Service, you're off and running. National Hurricane Center and all the rest of it. And there's so much more. But there is no set role for resilience in this organization. It exists across the organization as it exists across our federal family and across private industry. And so in order to think of how all these pieces fit together and how we can succeed in the face of the challenges related to coastal resilience, I have found it useful to look to the past, try to learn from history. And have we ever as a nation been faced with a chronic and massive source of flood risk 
upon which our livelihoods depend. Well, sure we have. Right? First levees were built in New Orleans in the early 1700s. Settlers bringing practices that they brought with them and knowledge they had from their time in France. And that system of flood risk management for the Mississippi River watershed has expanded since then. And we have reaped tremendous benefit from this system. Economic benefit, safe navigation, health and human safety issues, uh, quality of life issues. And yet, we could confidently say that today, this management system is out of balance with the demands placed on it, right? As we've heard, the demands that Mother Nature is placing on our engineered systems and on our communities is changing. And so when I think of the challenge of coastal resilience for the nation, I think of this example and I am concerned about the prospect of repeating some of the same old solutions and not continuing to innovate like Todd is helping us to do. So just a quick snapshot, how are we doing on flood risk management for the country? Well, not so good, right? We still have a long ways to go. We are doing better. We are doing good work, but we are not doing work that is good enough. So this is a map. This is great. It looks scary, maybe. I'm an engineer. I want to see numbers. Give me numbers. OK. Here are numbers. Last 10 years, cost adjusted apples to apples on impacts from top five riverine flooding events. One might credibly argue that we're not actually done counting 2019 yet. So we do the math. This is about $22 million, or $22 billion, excuse me, of impact. So next I'm going to show us the last 10 years of coastal losses, okay? And you know those things where you're at a conference and you do interactive voting and you get out your cell phone and you type in your answer? We're not going to do that. We're going to use something much more sophisticated. Think in your mind, if you think the coastal losses over the last 10 years are greater than what we're seeing for riverine losses, I'm going to ask you to yell out, boo, like, like a Philadelphia Eagles fan who just saw Santa Claus. Just <laughs> let them have it, boo. And if you think that the losses for the last 10 years on coastal events is equal or generally in the same ballpark or less than the riverine events, I want you to cheer like, yay, yay, we're not doing worse, OK? So this will only work if you make up your mind now. Am I going to say boo or yay? And when I give you the signal here, just as loud as you can, all right? So if you think they're worse, you're going to say boo. That's bad news. If you think they're better or equal, you're going to say yay. Three, two, one. Boo. Oh, interesting. All right. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Here's the answer. Boo, right? Boo, indeed. Like order of magnitude, boo. This is a whole different ball game of what we're facing along the coast. Now, if you're astute, you'll notice that five of those events for top dollar loss in the last 10 years are from 2017. So golly, maybe I cooked the books. Maybe this window of calculation is not quite accurate. And like we used to think about Katrina, maybe it was just an anomaly. So let's look at 2006 to 2016, right? Is this fair? Is that at least reasonable? It's better. It's not 10 times the riverine numbers, but it's about five times the riverine numbers. And so if we take the riverine loss of 22 billion, if we take the last 10 years loss, which totaled out that previous slide at about $371 billion of impact. 
So add all of that up, divide it by 10. So you have like sort of the cost per year. And then one of our favorite metrics, which is a really important step forward for our community, is the recent publications past few years about the true value of mitigation and reducing risk. So Chad, can I use six to one? Is that fair? That every dollar of mitigation spent helps us avoid six dollars of impact? And is it at least for back of the napkin math reasonable to say that we take these aggregate costs of impact and if we divide them back by six, we could be in the ballpark of what we would have to spend to mitigate these risks, all right? So if we do that, and depending if it's the really bad case or the just pretty bad case, we're looking at 25 to $65 billion a year in mitigation spending, uh, not a year, I'm sorry, per decade. So 2.5 or 6.5 billion per year in mitigation spending to offset this type of loss. I am concerned that we are not going to be able to achieve that. And furthermore, these estimates we know are low, right? What do they measure? They measure cost of damage to the built environment. They measure, they measure uh, direct economic loss. Do they measure impacts to water quality? Do they measure loss of ecosystem function? Do they measure the impact on a family of losing their business? Do they measure the impact on a community of the health and human safety services that are stressed? Do they measure the cost of the psychological impact when you suffer a trauma like this? They do not. So this is the low estimate. So this is concerning. What's the current state of play out there and these discussions nationally? So my kind of 30,000 foot view, there are positives and negatives on the state of dialogue for our country on these issues right now. A couple positives to start off. Public awareness of these issues has never been higher. Okay, if we were having this discussion 10 years ago, it would be an effort of a town crier trying to ring the bell and say that these risks are real and y'all need to pay attention to them. Uh, we are past that, for better or for worse. And even though the national dialogue on this topic doesn't quite feel that way, I am very confident that we don't have too much more convincing to do. Reality is a relentless teacher, and Mother Nature has been in our face about what that reality is. So the awareness being high is a real positive for us. Uh, second positive, issues aside from the economics and engineering impacts of these challenges are getting a higher profile and starting to receive the due that they deserve. So issues particularly of social equity and environmental justice are becoming foremost in the discussion alongside some of the more traditional pieces that we prioritize. The concepts that those with the least capacity among us are often disproportionately impacted by these events and often don't have a voice at the table to even engage with the discussion about how we move forward so the idea that we are more aware and more holistically aware as a nation are really positive. Some challenges that remain. There continues to be, in my estimation, a feeling that we can build or manage our way out of risk in its entirety that we are not holistically, as a collective, seeking to manage risk as much as we are hoping to eliminate risk. And this is a really hard hurdle to get over, but I believe it is critical in order to actually make ground on some of these issues in the long term. A 
couple realities from the federal space as I've found it. These questions of coastal resilience is a crowd, it is a crowded discussion. Everyone is here in the federal space discussing Corps of Engineers, FEMA, NOAA, US Geological Survey, EPA, NASA. NASA? The National Aeronautical, that's airplanes, and space, that's space, administration. Their Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is aircraft and spaceship engines. So the NASA JPL has 30 scientists working on questions of sea level rise. Everyone is here. And as a federal family, we are very poorly coordinated, okay? We do enjoy tremendous leadership at the program level where people that need to work together do work together and have found each other. And thanks to executive leadership like Todd, we are making ground at formalizing some of those connections higher through the executive ranks. But the federal agencies do a very poor job of defining our swim lanes relative to each other, separate from our authorizations. For messy spaces like this, it is very busy. And we do a poor job of cheering for each other in public and on Capitol Hill and saying how someone else's success is critical to my own success. And that's an area we need to get better. So here's what keeps me up at night thinking about this. The common barriers discussed for holistic resilient action are there's a lack of political will and there's a lack of money. There's a funding gap between what we would like to do and what we are able to do. I am certain that we are easily in the next decade and probably at the front half of this decade about to spend a whole lot more money on these issues as a country. Uh, FEMA's new uh, legislation, the DRRA, will be a game changer potentially in this space. I hope it is. And so let's imagine for a minute that we have the political will and we have the money to do what we want to do. What would we do if we had that today? I think what we would see are two things. One's everyone would run like hell to build our way out of this challenge. We would build every approach around civil infrastructure, large civil works. We would seek to eliminate that risk rather than seek to understand and balance our engagement with that risk over time. And I think that would be a missed opportunity. And secondarily, we would see every federal agency running to Capitol Hill saying, We've heard that this is an issue. I'm working on that issue. I can solve that for you, right? NOAA, NASA, USGS, the science agencies would say, what we need is more science, right? Just let me do more research. Let me do more observations. Let me do more modeling, and we will be good to go. If it's a core, the core would say, look at our civil works backlog. We have so much to do, just give us some money to go off and build what we need to build and we'll be all set. If it's the EPA, they would say, just follow our rules. We have put a lot of thought into this. We've written it all down. Y'all just need to do what we've suggested you do. And for FEMA, what we would hear most likely is, well, we need more insurance and we more, need more pre-disaster mitigation, right? Just let our hit, help us hit our moonshots and we are golden. And the challenge is that everyone is correct. We need all of these things without question. Except if we just use these on our own in absence of tighter coordination and a broader game plan for sustainable engagement with this challenge, we will come up short. It is entirely possible to receive the political will and the financial support we desire the two things we asked for the most. We could have them tomorrow and still fail to make significant progress on this challenge. The US government's role is to help us make ground on that and to coordinate better. We have a tremendous opportunity together to take inspired action on these challenges. 
right? The challenges are real, they are scary, they are hard, and cynicism abounds. Cynicism that y'all are cooking the books, it ain't that bad, we don't really need to prioritize these issues quite the same way you say we do. Or on the other way, cynicism about the idea that we have somehow missed a window of opportunity to influence meaningful change for our future. That's bullshit. Cynicism is fear. Cynicism is the fear of stepping up to the occasion and taking personal responsibility for these future outcomes. So how will I advise NOAA on coastal resilience? I will do so with a firm belief that our actions and choices on how we engage with this challenge represent our most significant opportunity to achieve positive outcomes for our future that we will have available to us over the next 30 years, without question. And I will also do so with optimism and courage about our ability as individuals and as organizations to step up to the challenge and deliver. <laughs>